everyone. Welcome to Wandering DMs. I'm Paul. And I'm Dan. And on this episode of Wandering DMs, we have a very special guest, Mr. Ethan Gilsdorf. And Ethan is a journalist, memoirist, essayist, critic, poet, and teacher. He's been featured on places like NPR, Discovery Channel, PBS, CBC, a whole bunch of other places. Of course, you probably know that Ethan is author of the award-winning book Fantasy Freaks and Gaming Geeks, an epic quest for reality among role players, online gamers, and other dwellers of imaginary realms. And Ethan has a TEDx talk that he made a while back on why D&D is good for you, which uh, I'm going to round off to about a million views at this point, is what I'm going to say. Ethan, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Pleased to be so, here. So, um, uh, we, we, I have, uh, as usual, I have like such a huge list of notes and questions that I want to run by you. Uh, as we get to that, I will uh, remind our viewers that today we are brought to you with the help of our friends at Describe.com with a special offer to our viewers, but more of that at the end of the show. Uh, let's see here. Now, I gotta, I gotta say, before we get into Ethan's work here, I gotta point out that this is a very momentous day, uh, for us, uh, us in, in, in the nerd culture, because of course today is both, uh, the start of daylight savings time, and it's Pi Day. And I will point out that this is the, only the second time in history that this has ever occurred here in the U.S. So I, so I have to, I have to observe that. And uh, so let me just point out, let me just point out two things here and make sure that we are all in agreement on, on these items is number one, uh, none of us like the daylight savings time start and that should stop and end. We all agree with that? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I heard that maybe there was a, something uh, that the Senate is, is maybe voting on uh, to just stick it forever. It'd be great. Yeah, well, that's, that's like the worst thing you can possibly yeah, yeah. do, right? <laughs> right, Ethan? Uh, it's, it's, it, it may be one of the few bipartisan measures that gets passed in this administration, but enough, enough about politics. But I think yeah, yeah. it seems to have weirdly, it seems to weirdly be like this thing that people feel really strongly about. So um, it's, uh, you know, it's a real deal. It's, I mean, I had to send an email around to all three of us, mostly to remind myself, because I have forgotten about this in the past. To not like accidentally miss the dang show today, so I had to do that, and you know it causes basically we're all jet lagged for a couple of days as a result. So yeah, I mean it yeah. should it should anyway we all agree with that we all know yeah, that. Yeah. And the other thing <laughs> is that Pi Day is fundamentally mistaken, and we should be celebrating Tau Day instead on June twenty eighth. And I mean obviously that's so obvious <laughs> we don't even discuss that. So moving on, and we'll be back around June to celebrate the proper Circle Constant Day. I'm glad that we all do that. So. <laughs> Robert Circle Constant Day. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so Ethan, yeah. I am so glad uh, that you could join us for one of our one of our nerdier days. <laughs> <laughs> I was Bring it on. reading. Bring it I, on. <laughs> so I read your book, uh, uh, Fantasy Freaks and Gaming Geeks, pretty recently, and uh, you know, among the things that popped out at me. Particularly, you know, the the start of your book is very is very touching, and I'm I'm so glad that you know you 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 got that documented and shared shared it with with everybody. Um, you so as it turns out, you and I grew up only five miles away from each other, on opposite sides of the Maine New Hampshire border. And Great. in your book, you write about uh, going to Oyster River High School. And personally, when I was in high school, I was driving by Oyster River High School all the time on the way to UNH to use their library to do some research probably on medieval history or economics <laughs> or science fiction or something like that. And it was, that's a location that's really isolated, right? Mm. I mean, that's, I mean, I, in a lot of ways in those days, that, that part of the country, we're not in a city, you can't travel around until you get your own car, it's hard to get gaming products, it's hard to make friends, frankly. Um, how much do you feel that, like, you know, this, the discovery of D&D &D filled in, a, like, a cultural hole for those of us that in particular lived up in kind of a more isolated part of the country? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that what's interesting about it, my, you know, my particular story may not be, um, you know, representative of other, other people's stories of that day, but for me, this is the late 1970s when I discovered the game, and it was through a uh, basically a, the new family that moved in across the street from me. And that's sort of the story I tell in my book, Fantasy Freaks and Gaming Geeks, that was really, really was not only just word of mouth, but like literally you had to have 
someone who had the game who had he heard about it or bought it um, and happened to just be your neighbor or you might meet them in school or you might meet them in a you know so it was very much obviously pre-internet for for those listeners or readers or watchers who were not aware there was a time when there was no internet and i think that's an important <laughs> that's an important distinction because because in those days yeah you, you might stumble across it at a gaming shop uh or just like a just like a toy shop or something at the in my case it was the the mall the, you mentioned university of new hampshire and there was a there was a uh, sort of a campus um you know, school supply store right on Main Street in, in Durham, and they they stock some D and D stuff from time to time, particularly when it became more popular. But but really, up until that time, I think it was really a random. Talk about a random encounter! I'm like, you just may not have ever heard of the game, and it wasn't like that. I it wasn't like I knew that I was dying for this cultural experience that I had been missing, that I was wanting, because I had certainly had plenty of other things that I was doing. As an eleven-year-old kid, you know, I was into reading and I was into writing and I was into art and, you know, um, had a lot of other interests at the time. But for whatever reason, it was the for me individually, it was like the perfect storm of of um, you know uh, this sort of as you said cultural experience and for me primarily this imaginative experience. It did fill in a lot of a lot of holes. And at the time, I was in a you know as you mentioned, Dan, in the introduction of my book, my mother had had a a catastrophic brain injury when I was, uh, you know, a young pre-adolescent. And so I could have, I suppose, escaped in other ways by doing other things. But for me, the idea that there was this world I could immerse my brain and heart into was kind of a lightsaber, a lifesaver, <laughs> a lightsaber. Maybe it was a lightsaber too. <laughs> a life saver. That's another story, which was Star Wars, which was also, Star Wars was on my radar. You know, uh, the, the, the year before I started to play D&D was I also saw Star Wars in the movie theater. So that was oh. 1977. And that was a watershed moment for me. And then 1978, along comes D&D. So, you know, it was a curious confluence of these little cultural things. And I think it was just the right age. Um, and uh, that was obviously, you know, as I write about in the book, and as I'm sure we'll talk a lot about, like, how the hobby or the game or the passion or the obsession of D&D provides this sort of launching point into a lot of different uh, other spaces, you know, creative spaces and, you know, careers and, you know, on from there, so... Yes, that's that's fascinating. I think, like, the, the, the idea of this... Um, um... The, the culture of of D and D, especially in the early stages, I remember as a kid when I was like twelve or so. Um, the only place I knew to get gaming material was the back of a comic book shop. Right there was there was no gaming stores around me, but if I went to a comic book store and went all the way to the back, there would always be a shelf of gaming books there. And I remember like in the back of those early books, as well as in like uh, Dragon Magazine, there was always ads for play-by-mail or uh, conventions and stuff like that that hinted at the existence of this culture. And to me, it always seemed like I was a mm. million miles away from that. Like somewhere out there, there's this collection of people and I don't know how to get to them. Yeah, I felt <laughs> the exact same way. And it, it, at that point, I was also just beginning to collect some of the early materials and you'd read it in the back of any of the... If you could get yourself a copy of, in, our, in my case, it was the basic box set that came mm -hmm. out. But then eventually the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons books, and there was always an ad or something. And then, of course, once someone in our group subscribed to Dragon Magazine, I don't know if it was me or someone else, or just picked up a copy, then you realize, oh, there's this place called Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, this sort of <laughs> mythical Wisconsin, which is like, you know, my, yeah. my grandparents were in Ohio, so I, I could sort of yeah. conceptualize what Ohio was. But Wisconsin was this yet other, you know, uncharted realm, and it felt like... Um, that was the portal like it was mail order right if you yeah. wanted to get stuff that your local game shop couldn't get in a funny way a precursor to amazon but instead of of course doing it online you are basically having to send an order form with a check that your parents have helped you fill out because you probably don't have a yeah. checking account yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah, exactly. put, it, put it in with the added fee for postage and handling and yeah. and uh maybe a month later you get something oh, yeah. four, four to six weeks right. total delivery right, right. Easily, <laughs> right. Easily, yeah oh man. Uh, but but that was to me that was it, it i mean it's not to say that like that was a better or different it was a definitely a different experience but i think it made it seem like um you know i had to work with the stuff i could find and there was some there was some ways in which all i had were those ultimately the three core, core rule books and between those three core rule books and my original box set which had that blue you know the blue book with the little you know the slimmed down version of of hmm. what later became first edition it was 
That was enough. <laughs> like, you didn't need, that's, that's the one. Yeah, exactly. I had the same thing on the shelf behind me in the corner. And, you know, and then, of course, we had Gamma World and Boot Hill, Boot Hill and other versions of, of similar RPGs that were kind of based on D&D. But that was all we needed. And, and from there is where I started to, like, pour into making my own maps and making my own worlds. And I have just I've miraculously saved all this stuff. And I have just piles of this stuff. And I was just looking through it last, last night again. I discovered stuff that I'd forgotten like, about once again, like in this folder or in this notebook, you know, whatever. You know, Paul, maybe um, pull up... Uh... I actually, I gotta point. I gotta say, I really like Ethan's designs. Yeah, no, like no, maybe, no. <laughs> maybe pull up the uh, maybe pull up the Dungeon Five, uh, Dungeon Five photo, and we'll come back to the, to the cooler photo. Yeah, the uh, totally totally famous blue that. cooler that I talk about but, in my in my. So is, 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 is this a, it? There you I, go. I don't have the file yeah. names here. I just have the images. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I like that design so much. I really like this. Yeah. So the, the 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 middle of it has this classic Gygaxian like use every space labyrinth. Yeah. And then you manage to squeeze a, a cave system around the edge, and I've never yeah. I never saw yeah. a design like that, and that really really yeah. tickled me. I think, so I think I remember little, this. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, I, th I don't remember anything about what this adventure is about, but I do remember at a certain point, you know, and we'll talk about this maybe a bit more, like how once I got into d and I got really interested in history. You were saying, Dan, you'd go to the UNH, the Diamond Library at UNH to find that rare book about medieval siege warfare or something, which is the kind of stuff I was constantly doing. And I was uh, really interested in history in high school, and so I took a lot of history classes. And persuaded my high school, you know, teachers to allow me to do these English papers or history papers about either Lord of the Rings or about basically medieval warfare. And I think we did a unit on um, ancient history. We looked at uh, uh, Crete and Knossos and the, 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 the is that pronounced Knossos or Knossos, you know, the sort of maze in the Minotaur that, and there's an actual ruin on Crete that looks a little bit like what you're seeing here. It's this, it's a labyrinth, but it's really... Um, not the, the classic, oh, okay. uh, as you said, Gygaxian um, tunnel, which is like this idea that every tunnel would have to be its own separate, um, you know, uh, excavation, which of course would have been incredibly expensive and time consuming, right. but rather <laughs> uh, a big space, a big space that gets divided up with these almost like partition walls, right? So I, I have a funny feeling that this is based on like, oh, I just learned about, you know, that piece of ancient history from Greece, and now I'm going to go like make a dungeon about it, you know? Um, that was my mo all the time. You know, I got to put a little. I got to put, put a little, mm -hmm. tiny little pin in the thing that just happened for you. That happens for all of us. And Paul probably knows what I'm about to say. Is part of you know. And, and as I said on, on on the email, actually, like I I constantly refer to all of us together as like people of the book. And you know, we learned it mm -hmm. through through books mm -hmm. and things like that. Is that everybody in this community has this experience of reading a particular word ten thousand times on the page. And then in public need to say it, and you realize that you've never actually said it out loud, and you don't know how to pronounce <laughs> right, it, right? right. Uh, right? Like, and I had I had a friend Nossus, who's what is it? Yeah. <laughs> exactly, and I had a friend from from Germany, right? English isn't even his first language, and we're chatting, and I'm like, you know, I spent many years pronouncing the word sword as sword, and he and, and Peter goes, yeah, me too. I totally did the exact <laughs> same thing for years and years. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I have, I have a story about that, which is which is having never said the word epic, uh, not E P I C, but the other one, and thinking it was E Pooch, you know. So. <laughs> oh right, 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 right. Yep. Right. E O C H. Yep, totally. Yeah. 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 Classic. And yeah, you're right. Yeah. I was, and I was. We, it wasn't a talkative kid. I was. I was actually quite introverted. So I was constantly reading stuff and had no one to talk to yeah. about it. You know, typically. And we have this enormous vocabulary. We have this, as it's called, high Gygaxian vocabulary that we've picked up. And then <laughs> and we never heard anybody say half these words. <laughs> right. oh, Only in dear. our heads. A little voice in our heads, right? That, yeah. <laughs> so that's that's part of that's part of the part of the community too. Um, uh, you didn't go to so so Paul went to a convention at a, at a, when his teenage years. I didn't go to a convention until much later, and I think you're in the same category as that, Ethan, right? Yeah, well, you know, it's funny you mentioned UNH, because it does occur to me that I believe one year, at some point when I was in high school, because I played D&D &D from a, initially from about seventh grade until senior year of high school, and I think at a certain point it's possible that my group... I have a memory of going to UNH for some relatively small convention, oh, okay. maybe just okay. just like hanging out for the day and not really participating. It was very informal. I just remember the thing, the, the, the memory I have in my head is some classroom that had been taken over 
and there was someone was doing some kind of medieval war games miniature stuff, and I was fascinated by it because they had hundreds of little, you know, figurines lined up on little wooden stands. Um, but I don't remember going and playing. I don't remember it being like a nothing like what we would see today, right? Where there's lots of merch tables and lots of companies there. Yeah. It was more of a gaming convention in the sort of most classical sense, like the Gygaxian one, where you just sort of show up with your friends to game, and that's really well all you do. You don't you don't actually uh, there's no corporate sponsorship or anything like that. No one's selling anything. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, the um, uh, I mean that's a, that's another aspect of you know growing up at the time of of uh, you know because I would see rules for war games like chainmail or something like that and i'd see the books talk about using miniatures but i wasn't in a situation where uh, like i didn't have a store selling the miniatures and even if there was like you're saying i would have had to get my folks to write a check and i didn't actually have you know i didn't actually have any funds to acquire it so i had like a 20 year um you know wedding of the appetite for these large war games you know these these large spectacular war games and not have any way to actually participate. Um, right. At this point, you've actually you've actually I think sat in on Paul Stromberg running chainmail at uh, I did. At a, yeah. at, a, at a convention, right? At the what's now called Gary Con, but at the time was called Lake Geneva Gaming Convention, which is for those of you who don't know, you know the birthplace of D and well, probably most of our readers or listeners know, or sorry, <laughs> audience knows where <laughs> knows the the D and D was founded and. In Lake Geneva, but there there was a rec maybe out of gosh maybe at least goes back ten or twelve years now uh, an attempt to sort of recreate those original Gen Cons actually in Lake Geneva, and now I think it's 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 just being called Gary Con. Um, yeah, I don't I, think it. I actually just I had, think it's uh, the last couple years. Yeah. we just had Luke Gygax on the show uh, yeah, talking about great. it uh, last week. Uh, Gary Con is when is that Dan? Is that is that happening right now? Uh, Are we yeah, Gary Con thirteen <laughs> actually occurs the last <laughs> weekend of this month, uh, twenty sixth through twenty eighth, and people can still sign up for Gary Con and uh, get it. There, I think they have some 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 preview events happening online at the moment, but the main event is the last month. So. There you go. And of course, if anybody didn't know that Lou Gygax is, of course, Gary Gygax's son, we should point, point right. that out. Um, yeah. So, so great event. Yeah. Paul and I have been to that once. Uh, would like yeah. to get out to that again sometime. Yeah, yeah, and that's where Paul was. There. That's where I met Paul that one time, and he, uh, you know, a huge D and D fan, and he has a collection, and he has, you know, networked. To, again, I don't know the whole story, but w when I was there, they had constructed this enormous table with the train, and there were literally hundreds. Mm -hmm. Of miniatures and the games took forever, which is an interesting reminder of how you can have that wargaming experience. Obviously, through other kinds of games that don't take as long, or certainly uh, an online game or you know some kind of digital version. But this was a, like you know tape measures and sticks and sort of moving through the like. I think it took them uh, twenty four hours to do one you know one <laughs> battle or something. I seem to recall it was a very long time. Uh, but you know, it's cool to think about like that being um, uh, again part of the, as you both know, part of the roots of the game is this idea that it's it's this tact tactile thing that is a map and you know mm -hmm. a figurine. Let me ask. Okay, let me ask this about um, the the like you're saying took took twenty four hours to play one game. So I when I was reading, <laughs> I, I don't think you are. Frankly, my first guess is that you're probably not. <laughs> uh, uh, we and and we, you know, so for Paul's birthday, we go to his place when we can, and we we actually there are 24 hours of videotape footage of us on YouTube uh, playing uh, last time we were at Paul's place. So completely, completely within the realm of possibility. Yeah. Right. Um, so. So when I was reading uh, your your Fantasy Freaks uh, book, one of the things I thought was so interesting is at the point where your friend JP uh, tells you for the first time that there's a game called Dungeons and Dragons. He there's there's at least the way you wrote it. There's two things that he the first two things that he says to pitch it are one you play a character, and two mm -hmm. there's all these rules. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, yeah. Yeah. And I thought, what an interesting sales pitch that one of yeah. the top three items is, hey, there's an enormous number of rules to this game. Right. And I had, we had a, 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 a really um, insightful viewer named uh, Daniel Tomovich, and he wrote me an email a couple days ago, totally unrelated thing. And just in passing, he said, you know, at the time when these games were originally written, he said complexity was part of the entertainment. 
And I, mm. I quoted him on Twitter, and that actually seemed to like push a lot of people's buttons positively. It seemed to really ring a bell. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, do you, do you mm -hmm. see that? Do you agree with that? Do you think that the complexity was actually a benefit back in the day? And, and do you think things have changed now? Or how is that? how does that feel to you? Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, I, I'm definitely not a historical, uh, you know, scholar on this topic. Someone someone who's interested in really delving into this can, uh, for example, read the book um, by John Peterson. I know you had John on a little while ago. His new book, The Elusive Shift, really talks about this. And I highly recommend it for you DD nerds out there who really want to take a deep dive into the the real early years of D&D &D and sort of understand how it these different opposing and pushing and pulling forces about the war gamers and the science fiction fantasy uh, sort of nerds, the people who came at it from literature, the people who came at it from role playing, they had, you know, dabbled in the Society for Creative Anachronism um, and how the game amazingly can be flexible and appeal to all of those different constituents, um, mm -hmm. you know, depending on, on the way you play it, the way your group plays it, and hopefully you find a group of people who like to play it the way you do. But I think I, as a I would say individually, you know, other than it providing a sort of framework for just general imagining, imagination and I was going to say imagineering, like, you know, Walt Disney <laughs> Company almost like the idea that you could, with this rough set of, this rough framework of sort of this is how you construct a world, it gives you free reign to sort of design that. But um, the complexity of the, of, of that, the underpinning of the rules, you know, at least for me as a teenage boy, I found it to be incredibly appealing um, because I really wanted to know answers <laughs> to things that I didn't have, you know, answers to. And all of the answers you needed were in the Dungeon Master's Guide, you know, or in the or in the Monster Manual or in the Player's Handbook. Um, so I think that's an appealing part of it. And I think what's amazing, what's interesting to say, this is going to probably open up a big can of worms about like whether more rules are better or worse. And there's no real, there's no easy, there's no correct answer to that question, but. Today, as a player, I'm less, much less interested in the rules, and I'm more interested in the social experience, and I'm much more interested in just the place my head goes. I, I don't really need rules, in a way, in some ways. Uh, in fact, my the, the infamous JP, who has been been referenced, is still in my gaming group, and you know we do still play. And he recently ran a campaign that had no rule, essentially no rules and no dice rolling. You know, it was essentially was a was a free form. RPG that of his own design, and that was a really interesting experience to see how far we could push the the outer limits of it without having things like a character sheet or a die roll. How do you negotiate the what happens in a game? Just as a conversation between players and game master. Um, so you know, I think uh, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but I, th I feel like the you know for certain players or for certain kinds of, you know, minds, you know, the, the, the sort of um, complexity or the possibility for complexity is infinitely appealing. Um, and, and yet at the same time, I feel like a lot of the way it seems to be playing now, and this is, I think, an ultimately a great thing for the hobby, is that, you know, the way, particularly the way fifth edition is, is you know, and people will argue with whether it's a, a plus or a minus in terms of what's the version of D&D that's being sold today, but I feel like with the, the, one of the huge benefits of it is that it's making, making it seem easier to get to, um, like, the on-ramp to the game is much easier. And they've, they've done such a good job of, I think, welcoming in anyone who wants to play, and we'll, we'll probably talk about some more of this, like just the influence of internet culture and live streaming games and such to make that possible. You realize it actually isn't that complicated, you know, in a way. You know, what you're seeing in, on Twitch is, you know, it's just people sitting around talking. There's a couple you know, die rolls here and there, but it's it's more of an experience that feel to me anyway, feels like, ah, oh, anyone could do this. I don't need to have specialized knowledge. I don't need to be only friends with this group of people, you know, who, who know how to do this thing that I've never heard of before. <laughs> I think that's very observant. And I think uh, a lot of us have observed the same the same things recently. Um, we, we broadly agree with that, Paul, right? Yeah, yeah. I want I want to dig more into this this sort of um, cultural evolution of um, the like you were mentioning the the on ramp of uh, getting into D and D and how how it's become mm. much easier. Honestly, I feel like uh, your own book plays actually a fairly important part in that. And I'm just going to point out one of our uh, one of our chatters here uh, requested. Uh, let's hear more about Ethan's book. Like, why did you decide <laughs> to write it? Um, 
And I think that's yeah. really fascinating, right? Because like, when we look back at the culture of D&D back in the 70s, and it was this, this very elusive, you know, word of mouth thing that, that we all felt like was very distant. And, um, and now it's just getting more and more and more accepted into the mainstream. Um, mm. I, I feel like that's like, for me anyway, when I, when I first read your book back when it was uh, originally published, I felt like that was the main thrust that I was getting at. It was sort of you grappling with what is the cultural acceptability of this this thing and should i dive back into it or should i keep it at arm's length do you yeah, agree with that yeah yeah definitely and i think for me i mean as a writer because of course you know the the secret backstory is that because i played dnd &D, i ended up becoming a writer and became interested in writing poetry and short stories and you know journalism and all this other stuff that i've gone on to do and, and ultimately um memoir writing about myself and you know my personal experiences and for me the uh, I had I had certainly, although I hadn't reflected on it quite as um, uh, seriously as I probably. Uh, what am I trying to say? I don't think I would have reflected on this question had I not sat down to write my book. But mm. indeed, you were saying earlier with the with the, the blue cooler, the the um, dis the discovery of my D and D stuff after having you know basically put it aside because I did stop playing D and D at a certain point. Mm -hmm. You know, after high school, I, I sort of dabbled with it a little bit in college, but I, I very quickly decided that D and D was not the was not the thing I wanted to be associated with anymore. I was I was quite quite clear in my head, even if I could have articulated at the time, that D and D was a child ga childhood game, and that this was something I did in high school, and you know, I'm going to shake this thing from my system in some way. Which is, you know, I don't I, I look back on that on that thinking is obviously very you know, flawed, um, and I wish I hadn't done that, but that's what mm. I did. And so mm. the, all my D&D stuff went to this, you're seeing it on your screen here, the famous blue cooler, which w eventually got moved around from, from place to place and eventually got put in, you know, all my D&D stuff and, and honestly some of JP's stuff and other other random things. Every time I ran a game, it all got put into this these, 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 uh, these boxes and folders and eventually ended up in this box. I opened up the box years later around my 40th birthday, and this was very curious. I had forgotten that I had saved it. I had forgotten how much was in there. And I'd forgotten about the, my obsession with it. I mean, I was really, you know, really, really, I was really into this game. I had, I had <laughs> forgotten. I pushed it so far away. And then it was this moment where I was like, oh, but also I was really into getting back into Lord of the Rings when the Lord of the Rings movies came out. And like, oh, Henry Harry Potter was happening. And this is before Game of Thrones. And there was World of Warcraft was happening. There were certain things that were happening at the same time as I just by chance in my own personal life rediscovered this stuff from my childhood. And so that the collision of those two things made me think there's something here for me to explore personally. And maybe, maybe my story is, you know, useful to other people. And that's where the book, ultimately the sort of Genesis for the book came out. And, and I think, I think what we've seen in the 10 plus years since my book was published, if I can believe it's been that long now, <laughs> is that this is now even more, even more acceptable and even more. And I think there's a lot of factors that, that have got into that, um, uh, some of which we've touched on already. But it's been a gradual evolution, I think, of this, this idea that all kinds of fringe cultural experiences are now sort of being mainstreamed and accepted, and um, and and D and D is definitely a huge part of that. I think it's it rode on the coattails of some other things, and I think it itself has helped legitimize and popularize other things. And so they've worked kind of in tandem together. I feel like. <laughs> And I'm curious. Keep coming up here. Yeah. <laughs> hey, they're fighting you. Sorry, I'm gonna just throw this in the front here. And <laughs> yeah, no problem. Get rid of my um, get, get rid of my get rid of my appearances. Uh, I'm kind of curious, just like like your own personal experience, then of having having written this book and trying to tackle this problem and, and answer these questions for yourself. Like, if mm. you were going to write the sequel, like it, after you after you finished the book, did you pack everything up and then walk away from it, and then it gradually came back again, or was that the beginning of the end of sort of you know you, you had dipped your toe in the water and and it just kept asserting itself as more and more part of your life? Yeah, it's funny. It, in a weird way, the book where the book currently ends is probably not the way I would end the book if I were writing it today, mm. because the book ends with me sort of saying, well, I'm not really sure, you know, I would love to teach this game to the next generation of people, you know, t t teach my nephews how to play. I'm not sure I'm going to jump in whole hog here, but 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 I, I'm leaving it as an option. And indeed, what happened was as, after my book came out, mm -hmm. I began to do events and talk to people and I realized, and then I met a guy who 
you know, helped to form together a, a, a group basically when I was based, when I was living in Boston at the time of a bunch of uh, middle-aged guys, basically, uh, you know, a kind of replica of my original gaming group, which included uh, JP, curiously enough, because he ended up being back in the same town that I was. So, I, <laughs> you know, my, 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 the sequel to my book basically says I'm playing it today and I'm playing it regularly. And not only that, I'm teaching other people to play. Um, and I'm really enjoying that, that aspect awesome. of it. And I'm sort of enjoying the idea that along with those efforts, what I'm seeing around me is a general resurgence in it. Um, and however people play it and whatever their sort of entry point to the game is, is great. And I don't have any strong opinions about whether it should be played this way or that way. I just am excited that people are finding it, you know, again. That's awesome. I, I think, um, you know, I, I feel like uh, you've become a, a, a very important factor in sort of the um, uh, being an ambassador into into the culture and into the hobby. Um, uh, I know certainly I see all the time going by on social media, someone will link an article of like, hey, d and is having a resurgence. Here's an interesting article about it. And inevitably, it seems to be that the byline is yours. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, OK, yep, yep. You wrote an article about this. Yep, yep, that's right. great. Um, well, and well, I'm really lucky that I've been able to turn my own, like, I've been lucky in that in my journalism career, stuff that I'm interested in, I've, I basically have been pitching. So it, it mm. works, it, it kind of worked hand in hand that like, here's something that I'm interested in. And I realized that I can both be a journalist and write about it, I think, objectively, but also, it also does help sort of, you know, it's all part of, and I want to say promoting it, but I mean, definitely sort of, you know, putting a positive spin on it because of course in the eighties it was, it was the work of the devil and it was going to yeah. turn your children into, into demon worshipers and, and all of that. Sorry. I did. I didn't interrupt you though. Sorry. You were, you no, were no, 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 that's great. That's great. That's great. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, th I just think that, that that works super important, honestly. I think that, like, uh, you've seen those articles. I mean, we had, uh, you know, it seems like quite a while ago now, we had Joe Manganiello on who was talking about sort of being being an ambassador to D&D &D and trying to, like, just trying mm -hmm. to normalize uh, its use, right? They're just sort of like, you know, hey, if Joe Manganiello can play D&D, &D, surely, surely I can play D&D &D and not, not feel embarrassed about it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and I think that's been a huge, I mean, I think that's partly what's happened in, in tandem with all these other cultural influences, whether it's um, Game of Thrones being a sort of primetime mainstream mm. TV show that people can watch and sit down, it doesn't matter what your interest is in, in the genre, because it's just a well-produced well dramatic show that, you know, otherwise n uninterested people would, would be interested in doing, and I feel interested in watching, and I feel like that is both part of what D D sort of laid the foundation for so that things like harry potter lord of the rings and now game of thrones could be popular but also the popularity of game of thrones has made it easier for people to imagine playing D D. and yeah people like joe or whoever else it is sort of celebrities now were increasingly talking about their interest in this stuff whether it's colbert whether it's yeah. anderson cooper or whether it's vin diesel you know the idea that uh, an A-list celebrity would would be sort of forthright about this is, I think, a huge a huge thing. People see that, and 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 so we we begin to see the game being referenced in TV shows uh, more so than like in my day. I feel like there was a reference to it in the movie ET and the in the TV show <laughs> Freaks, Freaks and Geeks, and that was pretty much all you saw or heard about yep. it in the in the popular right. realm, right? Um, right? And now it's just like it's just part of so many people's conversations it's not even necessarily uh, uh, something yeah. to be noted in a way if in yeah. a funny and way I, and I, I also feel like the, these pop culture references we're seeing pop up about it are becoming more uh, kind or endearing towards it rather than right. making it a mm -hmm. joke which I think is really really interesting right. and yes. important yeah or right. or, or the yeah. the fact that it's the, a joke like I'm thinking of that famous episode from community which now unfortunately has been stricken from the record due to an unfortunate uh, racial stereotype, but uh, or controversial one anyway, but the the idea that the plot of the show is about the social perception of D&D, &D, but ultimately, D&D &D wins over the those who are skeptical or think it's for mm -hmm. losers. It becomes a transformative experience for the group, you know, in, the, in this one plot, you know, in, in community. Um, and that's, it feels like such an important as you said, it's not even 
derided into sort of something that you do or it's a it's a it's a as as common as as playing a video game on your on your iphone you know yeah yeah uh, you know, Paul Griff. Uh, so, so we have Griff Morgan uh, in in our uh, live chat here, and maybe you could get his. Uh, he has a great question at uh, thirteen thirty-five twenty-one. Is this the follow-up question? Um, no, the one right before that. Oh, oh, um, I find it. Um, the it, it, it's immediately before that in the yep. chat. Just, uh, here um, we go. Uh, and and if anybody doesn't know, of course, Griff Morgan it has done Yeoman's work in uh, interviewing uh, original players in the Twin Cities for his movie Secrets of Blackmore. And uh, if you didn't know, actually, it was, it was offline for a while. We, Ethan and us, were talking about this right before the show, actually, but it's back online. You can see Secrets of Blackmore on Vimeo. And Griffiths, it's a great question. He says, when our author, when Ethan returned to RPGs, were you returning to your old systems or newer systems, mm -hmm. or were you interested mm -hmm. in something entirely different? That's a great question. That's a great question, Griffith, and I'm glad you, you asked that. And I'm also really excited to see your documentary. I really <laughs> wanted to see it earlier. So I'm glad it's back, it's back out there in the world. Um, I would say, on the whole, there's been an interest in my particular group with the, gr the, the group of 55-year-old guys, basically, if to, to put us into a, into a category of playing not necessarily original D&D, &D, but sort of versions of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons or various... various um, Sort of clones or something. We played it. We played a system called Basic Fantasy for a while. Um, played um, a version of. And now I'm forgetting it. Uh, what it's called? <laughs> Our new campaign is another similar kind of like um, a generic version of a kind of uh, a kind of uh, early rule set. But but at the same time, um, I was playing. Um, I've been playing Fifth Edition mostly with the high school groups that I'm. Um, been been, te been teaching because the products are sort of uh, available, and Wizards of the Coast has made a lot of that product available to people who are interested in teaching it. And and that stuff is easy to, hmm. particularly with online, it's easier to not easier, but it's just a convenient system that the the, the younger kids are probably more more likely to be familiar with. Um, but but I even find that fifth edition is even too complicated for what I what I need. You know, I find like I just don't need that many. That many bells and whistles, personally, um, and we, we curiously we started playing Call of Cthulhu, and we played um, uh, Traveler, which we never actually I never actually played before uh, back in the day. So different, you know, different RPGs set in different universes, not necessarily the the neo medievalist uh, swords and sorcery realms as well. Um, I think we all feel like we have in my group. We all feel like we have strong opinions about what how to keep playing with the with the rule system to kind of customize it to find that sweet spot which i think we're discovering in our group isn't the same for everybody um enough rules but not too many rules um you know a sense of what the what's what's attracting us to the game is it the role playing is it the the feeling of this old school dungeon crawl experience is it something else you know um we're still figuring that one out, but we, we we're we're sort of like uh, system agnostic, whatever. We just kind of we, we we try different things out and see see how how it feels. Interesting. I think um, I think a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people are doing that nowadays, and it, it, it like took me a number of years to really be comfortable with, you know, adjusting the rules flexibly. Again, as as someone who wasn't close to like Geneva and receiving the texts, you know, it looked. They look biblical to my eye. It looks like it's written, it's written <laughs> mm -hmm. here in black mm -hmm. and white. The text is the text. This is the word from Lake Geneva, and this is how it has to get run. And of course, people that that, that learned it in more of an oral tradition, you know, can sometimes you know um, it tease me a bit about that because they would say, well, obviously it's much more flexible than that. Um, but uh, that was a lesson that that some of us uh, took a while to to get actually. So it's good mm -hmm. it's good mm -hmm. to hear of us hear us all working in that inventive that inventive state, which I think is really was the point in the first place. Yeah, and, and I think I think at different t I mean, depending on how many years you played the game, it, at different times in your life, you may you may find it tickles different you know parts of your fancy or whatever you know different different ways. And I feel like as a teenage boy, I was very there were lots of battles over interpretations of rules, and that was an important part of, I think, what we might have been doing. You know, mm -hmm. if we 
put us under the therapist microscope, you know, <laughs> to, mix meta- mix, to mix metaphors, but like figure out how to resolve conflict, how to stand up for something you believed in it, 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 when you open up the, you know, I have it here in front of me, like this, the tattered old, you know, dungeon master's guide, you know, like this poor thing that's like been destroyed, <laughs> right? Because it's been, right. it's been referenced so many times, right? But, but those are important to say, those uh, having strong opinions about whatever it might be, how much damage this monster really does or, you know, anything, um, mm-hmm. how a magic item might work, uh, what the, the effect of a spell would be. Uh, you know, one and, thing and I'll point out, actually, actually because... not interesting to me. Yeah. Go ahead. Gotcha. Yeah. What, what is um, reading, you know, reading your book, it occurs to me that your your group actually mm-hmm. rotated uh, dungeon masters. And so I think mm-hmm. that your the your sir, your community everybody uh, had seen the, you know, behind the screen and felt that they had a voice in it. Whereas there are some other, you know, groups where there was just one person who was DM all the mm-hmm. time forever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and, and maybe in that kind of community, there might be more like, we're just going to take that guy's word, that, that uh, man or woman's word for what the rules are supposed to be. Um, yeah. Which is kind yeah. of an interesting dynamic. When I was reading fantasy freaks and gaming geeks, that kind of popped out to me because Mm. Paul and I actually have had rotating DM uh, games, but it wasn't until much, much later in our careers that we tried that. That's a really interesting thing. You're right. I think there were probably, you know, five or six people in our group that people kind of came and went, you know, but, you know, two or three people probably tended to be the game master more than others, but it was fairly egalitarian. And there's two things I thought about when you mentioned that. One is that when I go back through and look at all of the stuff that I designed, I would say 10% of it ever made it into a game. Hmm. I have literally yeah. dozens of these maps yeah. and dozens of these yeah. kind of kind of uh, modules that I'm designing and I'm kind of like writing out in full sentences descriptions of what's happening in each room as if they were going to be published, you know, by DS by TSR. It wasn't just like bullet points. It was like in this room you will, you know, find, you know, mm-hmm. it was like full sentences. And so a very very small percentage of that stuff ever made it into the game, which is interesting. It reminded me that as much as I remember playing, I think I actually spent more time just imagining and coming up with stuff for a for a uh, a game that probably never was going to get get played. Um, so that's you know sort of interesting. Uh, and now I've forgotten my second part of my I <laughs> tricked, tricked myself and for, forgot the second part of that. But I think that I think that you know for me that was so important was just having a place where it was it was a um, uh, a place to park my head where I could like design this stuff, and it didn't. Uh, it, sometimes it didn't matter that it ever got it got used in a game. It's it's, it's interesting. I think you, Dan and I have talked in the past about like the lonely fun of of uh, of, of sort of prep work, right? And and mm-hmm. is prep a thing that we want to eliminate and reduce because it just gets in the way and we just want to play, or is it is it actually its own activity and fun of its own right? Mm. Mm. Um, and c- certainly, certainly for some folks, I think that's that's a, that's a major part of it, right? That that sitting down, imagining the game, creating material is is absolutely part of the fun. Yeah, yeah, that's what I love with this this group of high school kids I'm playing with every week. Is I'm not sure that they're appreciating the amount of work I'm putting into it, but that doesn't matter because when it's time to run that session, you know, on Thursday afternoon, I have to think about what we're, we're playing on on uh, online now, obviously. So. Um, making maps and i insist on making them you know the old-fashioned way and i'll like get out the sepia colored you know pen and i'll you know crumple it up and stain it with tea leaves and set it on fire awesome. you know and, awesome. and then like take a picture of it and post it in the google drive and then we'll do a screen share i mean so it's multiple layers of hmm. being removed but i love this <laughs> idea of like these original documents even if ultimately they're shared digitally and draw making drawings and so i understand what at least is in my mind when I sit down to play. I don't know what's going on in those kids' brains and whether yeah, their yeah. imaginations are getting fired. Hopefully they are. Hopefully it speaks to some of them. Um, Dan and I are big, you know, big fans of yeah. artifacts of play, right? Of like mm-hmm. the, the mm-hmm. material that gets left yeah. behind at the end. And like yeah. I love the the you know we keep going back to the to your to your blue cooler there. I love that that you actually yeah. managed to hang on to this stuff. Um, yeah, we are constantly searching for artifacts yeah. from. Uh, the early days of gaming, because of course we love to talk about the history, and they're surprisingly yep. difficult to find. Yeah, we are. yeah, we are. 
I'll point, I'll, I'll be, point out be, Ethan sent over like a, a real treasure trove of images and, and that, that I was marveling <laughs> over last night. And and you're only seeing on the show, unfortunately, you're only seeing about 10% of them on the show. <laughs> um, but uh, but, but they, they, I, I really, you know, I really, you know, one of them, like in the, the, the front piece of your book, actually, the very, the, the front cover has um, a map, uh, you know, an, an overland wilderness map. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, is it's it this black one? Black and white. I'm looking. Nope. Now I'm look, I mean, that's it's gorgeous. Not that but there's one, a black yeah. and white that's one. That's another one. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's the there one. There it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I'll yeah. point out. Yeah. Okay. You know, and it's it's it has a reminiscent of uh, Lord of the Rings, Middle Earth, right? And I'll point out that on the bottom right, um, there's a, there's a forbidden zone that's that's surrounded by mountains that clearly looks like an evil location like Mordor, except here it's not Mordor, it's Bangor, which is the third largest city in Maine, um, which, yeah. I, which I laughed at really hard. Yeah. And I'll point out that yeah. um, my my partner here uh, re-invited Brooklyn artist Isabella mm -hmm. Garbani. When I first met her, um, and, and she's from France, she's from north of Paris, actually, uh, her, she and her uh, her best friend had a joke that, any, that uh, the people in Maine above portland all ate their dead and then it was it was a horrible <laughs> it was a horrible wasteland that you needed to stay away from, right so well, thank you so much to, for putting to, bangor talk to stephen king about that one yeah talk to stephen king there you go no that's great we're just I'm pretty close to where that. i went to university yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah I was laughing that. pretty hard at that <laughs> Yeah, well, it's funny because I've, so, but, I've done but, this. There's a show called Mortified, which is a a, um, a performance uh, series in different cities where people stand up and read their high school diaries and bad po bad poems and song lyrics that they wrote. And and I've done a version of this talking about my D D stuff. And that's one of the jokes. As I looked at this map, I was like, "Wow, it's number one. It's amazing in terms of like the detail <laughs> for a, for a 16 year old kid or however old I was when I when I drew it." But then I, I then I saw the Bangor and I'm like, "Yep, I was totally <laughs> either like ripping it off intentionally, hoping no one would notice, or it was just in my head." I'm like, "Oh yeah, the evil people. They live in the lower right corner of the world, you know. <laughs> and there's a mountain range. There's a mountain range that separates them from the rest of the world." And and and. Uh, Bangor. Yeah, well, I'm glad I could give you the payoff 40 years later that somebody knows. Yeah, it. yeah, right. Yeah, I know. Oh man. But Pretty more awesome. generally, right, yeah. the artifacts are surprisingly hard. You know, surprisingly rare. And you know, there are some people like uh, you know you a little bit and John Peterson and Griff Morgan who mm -hmm. are going way out of their way to you know rediscover this stuff. On the one that you know the thing that that, that Paul and I have been talking about quite a while now is we would love to see you know uh recordings of play like original recordings of play mm. from mm. the 70s or 80s and of course the holy grail would be either gygax or arneson uh you know a, a video recording super 8 an audio cassette recording i mean these te these technologies existed i mean it wasn't like they didn't exist but but oh my god uh it, it doesn't seem like maybe those particular artifacts exist and it's a little bit disappointing. I would love to see that. Um, of course, you uh, did actually have at least a short Super 8 film that you put mm -hmm. up on YouTube mm -hmm. of you and your friends. There isn't any audio to it. Uh, no, nope. playing D and D. It's one of the only ones that I've seen. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you put it up there. I don't know if we have time yeah, for a yeah. little I'm gonna, short snippet. I mean, of that, since, Paul. since there is no audio, I'm just going to chuck it up, and uh, it'll be playing yeah. in the in the corner of the screen, and we great. can talk over it. Great. Great. That's a great idea. Great. Yeah, it turns out there's there's really isn't much about that, and and I. I think we were fortuitously put it on the internet and people have contacted me to use it in documentary movies because of its um, value. So yeah, this is the, this is it's the real deal. Very this rare. is rare. <laughs> we'll put it in a very yeah. rare category. Yeah. That's JP. That was JP. <laughs> yeah, these are the guys I played with. I don't know, it's probably sophomore year of high school or maybe fr freshman year. I'm not exactly sure. Um, now are you and, just, uh, just... You can see the... You, Go ahead. Sorry, are you? Are you, you is this character. actual film of actual play? Are you playing it, or is this posed? Yeah. <laughs> no, this is real. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't playing. I'm behind the camera for most of this. There's a one shot of me later on, but that dungeon master screen—that's JP again. Uh, that's me in the middle there in the striped shirt. Nice. So someone else was on the camera. I had it on, you know, auto whatever cable release, and we did some goofy things with stop motion and. Um, oh great. But all the all those you know all those things like you're seeing like the dice that's there like I still have that dice bag you know this is that <laughs> dice bag and and of course all the all the 
all the rule books are the same, and I still have the Dungeon Master screen that I use. Awesome. Um, awesome. Yeah, this is in my, my my living room at my house. Um, and and astute readers have noticed that the the, the module we're playing is the the fire. Uh, what is the one? G one fire. All the no. fire giant king eight all the fire D &D yeah. module G three. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, yeah, it's the real deal, man. That's <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's the most, it's, it's yeah. The, I think it's the most brutal uh, adventure ever written, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's Gamma World for those of you. We were playing Gamma World around the same time. Unfortunately, most of this is poorly shot, and is there it is. That's the map for that for that module. It's my birthday party, I believe. So we're having cake, and um, <laughs> fantastic. That's but, great. But unfortunately, you know, I so say, much of it. When I, when I look at no. when I look at one of these things, I got to point out Mountain like, Dew. The by the way, that was Mountain Dew. <laughs> <laughs> for real, for real. That's awesome. Sorry, that's uh, awesome. I mean, you know, it, like I, I like I when I see something like this, and I think about the difficulty of getting it, because of course, any of us could take out our cell phones nowadays and immediately take a video and have it available and put it online if we want to. But for a Super yeah. Eight film like this, and I, you know, I, and I was working with Super Eight around the same time. Uh, you had to go and get the film, and on was, you know, ten, twenty dollars for the film, and then you'd have to take it. You had to, you know, conserve yep. the film and decide what you're going to do very carefully. Then you'd have to be able yep. to get to uh, a, 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 a film store to get it, um, uh, you know, produced. Jeez, what, is, what is the word now? Developed. Yeah, Thank you very developed. much. And then you had to go exactly. back another yeah. day and like like a couple weeks back, I did the math yeah. on that, and yeah. like that little piece of tape right there. In today's terms, would be like eighty dollars of of yeah. value, you know, based on inflation. And, and it's, like, it's I noticed three that you were long. using the, <laughs> yep, exactly. And I noticed that you were using the gold, uh, you know, uh, AD and D character sheets from back in the day. And even for that, even for a character sheet, like I had to plead to my mother, who happened to work in a school, um, to go in and use the copier on the sly. And get the gold yeah. paper and make some character sheets, and the whole thing was like this Ocean's Eleven uh, scam <laughs> that we had to pull yeah. off with multiple people just to get character sheets. Yep. It took a lot of work. Yep, yep. yep. And we I, were con I was constantly making my making my own character sheets and, and running them off at the uh, yeah some someone who had a photocopier and some which were at that in those days were not that common at least initially. And it was yeah, it was like you had to just like. If you couldn't find it or, or, or order, order it, or you would just sort of DIY it, you know? Yeah. I, I certainly I, I, had I that experience that, as well, Dan, of, of, of sending my yeah. dad to giving him the character sheet. Dad, take this with work to you. <laughs> take this yeah. with you to work and, and you know, get me, get me some copies on the sly. We all did that. I, I, I will point out, Ethan, that you having pointed out, you know, that you having succeeded at actually digging up some of that footage is that I actually went down into my basement in my apartment here just yesterday. And mm -hmm. I don't have a blue cooler, but I do have some boxes uh, of nice. stuff. And I was like, I wonder if this thing is still there or whether I lost it over the time. And I, and I, I, did, I did find this. <laughs> so I did find a VHS videotape. Ah. And you see here, it says, like the second line there says paranoia game. And so I think around 1985, um, I was running a paranoia game with a lot of uh, paraphernalia, like fake guns and armor and stuff like that. And I gave one of the players a uh, VHS video camera and had them act like it's a tricorder and actually tape the game in the game as the character who's supposed to do that. And so now I just got to figure out how to convert this VHS <laughs> tape right. into some kind of digital yeah. format. But I found you it. You can do it. And I, can and do I wouldn't it. have yeah, even gone looking for it if you hadn't inspired me to do that. Oh, well, that's nice. Yeah, well, I'm glad. Yeah, those are fun. I mean, to me, I'm just a super nostalgic guy, and I feel like... There's not a lot from my childhood that I've saved, and a lot of it hasn't survived, unfortunately. But when I see that stuff, it feels like um, such an important clue, you know, because I'm trying to figure out who I am and who I was. And mm -hmm. it, it just feels like a really important, for me personally, that particular time of my life was a really important part of my life. And, and any bit of ephemera that I can recover, like an arche archaeologist in a way, like, and, and that it's readable and I can glean from it some kind of you know nugget of of truth or anything it just gives me a uh a uh an insight into that time of, of my life because it wasn't i didn't do a great job of like conserving it or like necessarily keeping it separate it's like it's mixed in like in the back of a psychology notebook there's like 
notes yeah. for a D&D thing. Like, it's all yeah. all that. It's like it, it intermingled with my life at the time, which is interesting. Yep. Yeah. I, I just discovered the same thing, actually, in a college book just mere days ago. You know, one thing yeah. um, before we run out of time, uh, you know, the other thing we, we didn't get to touch on very much is your, your very well-regarded uh, TEDx talk on why D&D is good for you. And this is something that's been on my mind mm -hmm. for years and years. So maybe you could, maybe you could give us our, your pitch in a couple minutes of what would, be your, what would be your elevator for pitch for why, in fact, <laughs> D&D is good for a person. Well, I think I think my thank you for mentioning that. I think um, like a lot of my a lot of my life, I think I'd maybe made made a made a strong a strong uh, a play for like recasting all the stuff that I assuredly was a waste of my time on my teenage years, and now finding some value in it. You know, like this actually maybe taught me something. Like anything, ultimately te teaches you something. But but basically, the the pitch of my of my talk is basically that while you're playing this game, you're sort of learning other skills, life skills, right? And th those might be around team building or co collaborative working together as a team. It might be about problem solving outside of the box. It might be about actually, I, I kind of make a make an argument in the talk about empathy. It's the idea of role playing um, another character or having to interact with someone in this imaginative space as another character. You are learning about how to sort of see um, a, a problem or a situation from another person's point of view, um, you know, or or just the idea that this imaginative, you can tell your own story, like you can tell, you can be the hero of your story, you can be the victim, you can sort of find a way to cast your life in a way through this uh, storytelling medium, right? This is really what D&D &D ultimately, I think, I think ultimately has turned out to be as a really powerful medium for storytelling. And, um, and it also, on a very practical level, teaches you so much about how to sort of, um, you know, use your brain in a, in a new way, because perhaps yeah. we've lost that that skill of, of of oral storytelling, which I think was such an important part of has been an important part of human history, and we've we've largely abdicated that space to, you know, professional writers and professional storytellers and movies and television, um, which is great, and that this all that stuff is great. I love it, but. But when do you sit down with with your tribe and your group and talk about something that happened to you, whether real or imagined? Um, and that's not as maybe not as common as it used to be. And so I feel like D and D provides that that framework for it. So that's basically. I may have hit the main. I think there were five things in my talk. It's been a while since I've actually sat down and watched it, so I forget what I'm saying in it. But that's sort of the pitch. Um, and I'm fortunate that it seemed to have touched a you know, nerve or what not nerve, but it sort of t tapped into something that I think that a lot of people felt very strongly about, which is that maybe I wasn't wasting my youth, you know, mm -hmm. or my, or my early adult years or whenever it was you learned to play the game, you know, it actually you're, you're like any, any experience like this, you're, you're learning stuff and it's, 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 it's valuable. It has value. That is, that is really wonderful observation. I think it resonates, you know, for some of us so very much. And, one, you know, like, like, a, like a footnote that I would add to that is like for some of us who, uh, you know, feel like the world is, uh, you know, depending on, you know, maybe some of our brothers and sisters who are, you know, not quite exactly neurotypical, um, uh, you know, for some of us who see the world as, as a chaotic or unpredictable place, you know, mm. a, a system that has defined rules that you can kind of deduce and use as a place to practice courage, maybe emotional courage, in a safer yeah. space before you have to do the same kind of thing in a, in a larger venue has been just completely invaluable to, to you know, sometimes practice emotional courage. Um, yeah. And uh, I think that's really well put. Yeah, that's really, that's really for me was like the number one, in a way it was a social tool to get out of my, yeah, to subvert my usual tendencies to sort of be, introverted and sort of um not assertive and to try that out in a, in a safe environment so that the hope is that later transfers to your to your real life uh and i think in my case it did or at least mostly has i mean obviously you know i'm a work in progress like we all are but um it's part, it's part, of, well. part of who i am yeah. i think so yeah, <laughs> yeah I think we're doing pretty well.
Well, I mean, you know, I, if 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 we yeah. went back uh, thirty or forty years and we said yeah. to our to our prior selves, like, look at this, is this is this a life yeah. that you consider to be acceptable? I think many of us would go, yeah. that's way better than I was guessing. <laughs> right. <laughs> Although I will note that I'm. I will note that I'm still in the basement. I'm down here in my basement in my house, you know, in my little, the little nerd, the nerd cave behind me, the little, little, the little nook of, uh, of adolescent, uh, you know, whatever. But this guess, is, this you know, is, even uh, up, I gotta say, even up to 20 years, even 10, 10 years ago, and if I'd said like, I, like, like any of us, me, you, Paul, any of us would have been willing to display that publicly, I would have said, yeah. get out of here. That's ridiculous. <laughs> that, that's, that's insane yeah. and yeah. will never happen. So already yeah. we've, yeah. we've kind of, we're kind of at, at you, you, Ethan, have kind of been at the lead of a revolution in exactly that. Oh, well, thank you for saying that. Yeah, yeah. When I, te when I teach my, because I mainly make my living as a creative writing teacher, when I teach my classes, I literally take this computer and I flip it around. The other side of this room is a big whiteboard that is... <laughs> No, nice. like nice. the sort of the, profession, the professional, the professional sort of upstanding Ethan who wears collared shirts and teaches creative writing classes, and then nice. we flip it around, we go through the back of the wardrobe, and you know here we are, really on the nerd game side. Yeah, you know, awesome. small house living, small house living. Yeah. Yeah. I love that so much. <laughs> well, we're we're about out of time here. Was there any any yeah. topics we didn't get to, Ethan, that you were you were hoping to bring up? Ah. I feel like we've, yeah, I just feel like we've covered so much and, you know, right. obviously it's a free flowing, free flowing conversation. Yeah. Um, but I feel like, uh, you know, it's just, I'm just excited that this is a conversation that people are having and that it's of interest to people, you know, just the yeah. idea of like being nostalgic about this or thinking about, you know, the roots of the game and, and more, more, most importantly, like what this, what this game means to us. Cause I think it means, it means different things to, to different people at different times of their life, mm -hmm. and and I think there's there's a lot more to a game like D and D, or you know, obviously other experiences similar to D and D, but uh, um, RPGs in general, or you know, just are are such great uh, opportunities to connect people, and that's what I love about also what this game does. You know, whether it's a, a talk show like this, or you know, a, a podcast, or whether it's just a, a reason to get together with with people. You know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and in times of like now with the with the the pandemic, obviously that's you know more important than ever. So totally agree, absolutely. So, so, Paul, so aren't we? we as, as, <laughs> go ahead. No, go can. ahead. I was going to say, aren't we wonderful? We just packed that open the back. <laughs> We're doing pretty well, Paul. Before we wrap, there's one other image of Ethan's that I wanted to look at, and that's the we we saw his uh, Dungeon Master's Guide earlier. So there's an image of his Dungeon Master's Guide and the two other AD and D books, and they are. Uh, protectors oh, yeah. are just the three books there, right? Yeah, yeah. So, right. So we, yes. we saw your DM's guide, right? It's pretty well beat up. Uh, there, yeah. You know, those of us who grew up in the 70s, there was a way to protect them. <laughs> in particular, right. we were probably That's got right. from our loaned um, uh, school books is you could, you could, you could cut up exactly. a brown uh, a shopping bag and wrap your AD&D book up in it. <laughs> yep. And um, yeah. I don't show yeah. my AD&D oh, look books look on camera that. very much uh, because, uh, because awesome. I'm a little bit embarrassed about the fact yeah. that my, my AD&D books are still wrapped in the same brown wrapping that they have been yeah. since the 70s. Yeah. <laughs> So this is the first. As they so should. Ethan, you just gave me the courage to show them on camera <laughs> for the first time because I honestly, I've shown all my other books, but these ones I've been too embarrassed about. But finally, you've got them on oh, camera, so thank you. There you that go. Makes, well, I'm glad I gave you the, the little courage you needed. But I mean, I feel like <laughs> that's what's so great. Like if you save this stuff, it's like now you look back on it, and you it's a it's a portal. Like you're like, oh my god, I remember yeah. that moment yeah. where you get the you get the tech you get the textbook and you. Your teacher says, "Go yeah. home and take out the take out the brown shopping bag and cut it into a square and wrap yeah. it around your books." You know, and yeah. I was like, "That's yeah. what you do with yeah. your important books, your important tomes." Yep. So yeah. yeah. What one of the like so this one here, like my monster manual, my friend Steve wrote you two right on the cover when he when he got it at some point, yeah. and there was yeah. some uh, uh, you know really wonderful uh, young lady in my junior high school class who got one of them like drew a heart on it and went, "How's D and D?" Nice. And I was so upset. I was so upset <laughs> that, my, that my cover had That's been so funny. had been defaced. <laughs> Someone did a little caricature of Garfield on mine. I don't know who did that. Oh, great. That yeah, there you go. Great. Yeah, it's like 
Random and now stuff. they're so precious. I'm so glad we. I'm so glad that they that they they became part of our time capsules. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at an old an old uh, one of the many d old dungeon maps, and I saw that someone in my group had done the logo to the band the Doors. You know, the Doors has that very specific. Yeah, like course. just in the middle of like a, a record of like an adventure with like monsters killed, you know, experience points gained, you know, a, a, some kind of some kind of map, and then like someone's doodling like. You know, Zoso or you know the Doors or something like that. <laughs> Little it's like that's that's and that was what was happening. Like we were playing D and D and listening to the Doors or whatever it was. You know, yep, that was awesome. on our brains. That's awesome. Anyway, fantastic, Paul. Thank you well, for letting me get that last shot. Yeah, in. yeah, for sure. For <laughs> yeah, sure, for sure. That's awesome. I'm so glad you saved that stuff. That's so cool. <laughs> likewise, um, likewise. Yeah. If you uh, viewers want to see Ethan's TED talk or uh, link to the to the video that we were watching earlier of the uh, the Super Eight footage, um, uh, or or uh, find find a copy of his book, um, definitely take a look at the descriptive text here on this video. Uh, links to all that stuff will be included below. Um, and uh, while you're there, we'll also check out the link to our uh, generous sponsor, Describe, uh, available at uh, describe.com slash wandering. That's D-S-C-R-Y-B dot com. Uh, Dan, what can our viewers find at Describe? I'm, glad, I'm so glad you asked, Paul. Uh, Describe provides professionally written boxed text. They provide short, clever, evocative, well-written uh, descriptions for new spells or new magic items or monsters or locations that may pop up in your game. So if you are a game master and you are an adult and you are short on time, you might find that Describe.com really helps you save time in your preparation. They also have a search tool so that when your players go completely off track, you can dig up a new description on the fly that you hadn't even thought of before. Uh, and of course that is Describe.com, D-S-C-R-Y-B.com. And if you make an order today and you put in the code WANDERING, you will get 10% off. Awesome. Um, what else, Dan? I forgot what comes next. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, right. Uh, I guess I should say that yeah. uh, if you are new to the show, uh, maybe you've come to see uh, Ethan's interview here for the first time. Remember, of course, you can like follow and subscribe to us, The Wandering DMs, for more content like this, uh, more special guests coming up. Hopefully we'll get Ethan back another time because we've had multiple viewers today saying we need at least another hour for this. Can you come back some other time, Ethan? Yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. We'd we'll happy, be happy to do so. so. Yeah. Um, so if our viewers uh, follow us, of course, we are on Twitch, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and YouTube, and we do have the handle Wandering DMs on all of those sites, so please look for us there and um, hit a link in order to follow. And, uh, and don't forget GitHub. Anyway. And don't forget GitHub. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you prefer to uh, listen to our lovely voices in audio-only format, you can do so. Uh, our shows are available as podcasts on our website at wanderingdms.com. You can also find us on various podcast carriers, such as iTunes or Google Podcast or Spotify. If you're listening to this on one of those other carriers, please take a moment to rate and review us on that site. Uh, that helps other users of that site find us, and we really appreciate it. It really does. Uh, upcoming this week on the Wandering Games channel on YouTube and Twitch, uh, Paul will be back on Thursday with 10 Dead Rats, our uh, delightful, uh, free-flowing mashup of Warhammer and D&D together with some live play Thursday from 8 to 10, right before Critical Role, if you need something to fill that time in your life. Saturday, I will be back with Isabel for the Book of War Wargaming sessions Saturday night at 8, our chainmail-like uh, cut down rules light uh, uh, traditional D and D war game on Saturday, uh, and then more talk uh, next Sunday. Finally, a uh, big thanks as always to our patrons who support the show. Well, the Wandering Dams here. We could not possibly have wonderful, wonderful guests like Ethan here today without your generous support. If you're in a position where you'd like to join our patrons in supporting Wandering Dams for more shows like this, please do go to Patreon.com/slash Wandering Dams. Uh, anything I'm forgetting about, Paul? Uh, just a reminder that our patrons, one of the many benefits our patrons do uh, get to partake in is the private Discord server, uh, where Dan and I go to after the show uh, to have a chat with anybody who happens to be hanging around. So uh, for those of you who are patrons, uh, as soon as we wrap up here, come join us on the Discord and we'll uh, continue the conversation there. 
Right. And there's a, a plus uh, private uh, videos that are only uh, shared with our patrons and polls on things you'd like to see on our blogs or our show coming up. Uh, Ethan, uh, don't forget uh, that uh, viewers should get uh, Ethan's book, Fantasy Freaks and Gaming Geeks, if you haven't already read it. What a wonderful, wonderful read and just prescient and, you know, almost predicted the, you know, the explosion of interest in uh, fantasy culture that was going to happen uh, in the last couple of years. And, of course, watch his TEDx talk on why D&D is good for you. Ethan, thank you so much for, uh, for being with us today. Well, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Paul. I really had fun chatting with you guys and nerding out about this stuff and great. um it's great to meet you both and yeah we're happy to come back anytime so let me know and uh, <laughs> hope everyone gets has a great whatever go be inspired and go have a great D D experience we will all look forward to having ethan back on again for the other 90 percent of the notes <laughs> that i had here that, questions to ask that we didn't get to so we'll make it We'll get, we'll get it up to from 10 to 20% next time. Uh, and of course, uh, we don't forget, we are live every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern time, so we hope you'll all come back and join us again for another thought-provoking discussion. We'll see you then. Bye, everyone.